CDC back probably a decade ago actually did a preparedness campaign when The Walking Dead was first available and they did a, you know, don't be a zombie, be prepared, all, all kinds of preparedness. This is very unlikely though. Um, most fungal infections are from environmental exposures. Uh, most are not spread person to person. And the ones that do spread person to person don't spread anywhere near as easily or quickly as viruses do in humans. This is partly the human body's got different immune responses, our temperature is higher, uh, we have antifungal medications available. So certainly public health pays attention to fungal infections and fungal outbreaks and we can talk about it, but it is um, quite unlikely that a fungus would cause a global outbreak. We remain much more concerned about viruses like COVID, like influenza. Uh, but just for fun, uh, I did do a little bit of a deeper dive into the fungus that is portrayed on this very popular new TV show. Um, it has a long scientific name. It is based on an actual fungus. Um, cordyceps is the family. And yes, this is an actual fungus. Uh, it can infect and kill insects. There's about 400 different species of this cordyceps fungi, and each of those species has evolved to better target a different species of insects. So species of various ants and beetles and flies and spiders, but insects. And the way that this fungus works and why the writers of this show, you know, adapted it um, is that the, the fungus takes in nutrients from the host. It fills the insect's body with spores to let that fungus reproduce. So the way it works is the spore comes, it lands on the host, meaning the ant, the beetle, the fly. It lands on their exoskeleton. Um, and then eventually the spores uh, and the infection makes its way into the brain. And then there's this mind control concept. So for those of you who follow zombie movies, there tends to be this idea of infection taking over the mind. And the reason that the writers chose cordyceps is that um, cordyceps do sort of control the insect's brain. So let's talk about that. Once inside the insect's body, the spores sprout these long um, tendrils, kind of mycelia they're called. Uh, and scientists aren't entirely sure how this works. So either there are fungal spores that eventually reach into the brain or they're releasing chemicals. Maybe there's some physical manipulation of muscle fibers uh, from these chemicals. They're not entirely sure, it turns out. But the chemicals or this other manipulation from the fungus, it actually compels the insect to move. It makes this infected insect move to the favorable location where the fungus can thrive and grow. So usually it'll make the beetle or the ant or whatever climb high to where the wind can pick up the fungal spores um, before expelling its, its spores. The fungus then keeps eating the insect and sprouting new spores. The spores burst and release more spores into the air and infect more hosts. So it's this really unusual cycle. Um, this is a picture that actually won a competition last year in the 2022 BMC Ecology and Evolution Image Competition. This is an example. Um, Roberto Garcia Roa is the photographer here, and he's also a biologist in, from Spain. But he takes this in the Peruvian jungle, and you can see this is a, um, an insect, and there are these mushroom-like things sprouting out from the body of the victim. Um, and the idea is those fungal spores can then spread, land on the bodies of other insects, kind of burrow in and infect them. So there is some basis to the idea that there is uh, an, a, an actual fungus and that it can spread among insects. Um, but even this you know, so-called zombie ant fungus, it is nowhere near as dramatic as the show. It does not infect other house through the mouth. Um, the insects who are infected, they're not networked. They're not connected to each other in any way. And importantly, this fungus cannot infect humans. Um, first of all, our body temperatures are high enough that the proteins would denature. Really, it's not gonna survive. Um, and this fungus has evolved over millennia to attack insects in very specific ways, like through the exoskeleton, which we don't have. Um, and, you know, you can think about climate change. It's right to sort of be aware. Uh, but yes, there are fungal species that are also known to alter a human's mental processing. The best known is probably psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Those are um, 
fungi that that humans are known to ingest and that will affect their their uh, mental processing, but not in a controlling them kind of way. And we are very, very likely to have a global fungal outbreak as portray portrayed in the show. But I did just want to take a quick moment to say there are other human fungal infections, though. And it's a good example of something that public health is often doing behind the scenes. We do see occasional outbreaks. Um, valley fever, or the, the formal name is coccidiomycosis, is an environmental fungus that's found mostly in the western U.S. and histoplasmosis is a disease caused by histoplasma capsulatum, a fungal, um, a fungus that's more often found in the central or eastern U.S., including Illinois. And I have worked on fungal outbreaks when I when I was previously um, based at the Illinois Department of Public Health. Histoplasmosis. Um, the idea is there are fungal spores uh, that are found in the soil, and then if those spores get disturbed, if you're doing a construction project or you've uprooted uh, trees on a dry and windy day, and there's been a lot of, for example, bird and bat droppings, and that fungus has uh, resulted in, has really built up in the environment, um, those can get into the air and people can breathe in the spores and, and can get sick. Most people don't get sick at all. Um, if people do get sick, it's flu-like symptoms. For most people, cough, difficulty breathing, and fever. Um, but it's especially people with suppressed immune systems are at higher risk. And you know it can be fatal, rarely, but it can be fatal. And so public health, we track this. We track cases of, in Illinois here, histoplasmosis. Um, but across the country, we watch these other ones. But I want you to just understand the scale here. This map from the CDC shows there have been 105 histoplasmosis, that's the one more often here in Illinois, detected in the whole U.S. between 1938 and 2013. And the total cases associated with those outbreaks um, is less than 12. Uh, the largest one was about 143 linked cases. And so we are not talking about millions of people. Um, certainly, again, as we're seeing some climate change and we're seeing uh, fungi and mosquitoes and other changes, you know, th there's certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, but uh, we have folks at the Chicago Department of Public Health and the Illinois Department of Public Health who know this, who follow up when there are cases, uh, who work to investigate uh, and to make sure we're not seeing more spread. But this is not spread person to person and neither is valley fever. So I hope that helps just put it in some context.